You know what it was? Yeah. You've seen other material? <laughs> I wish I had. No. But I recognize the airfield, though, and from that... Uh... How did you get the film? The usual British security leak. <laughs> we were able to intercept the agent here. A combined operation. Where was he going? Moscow? <laughs> that was the immediate British or something. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked us to help. But the Americans are interested in VTOLs, too. Commercial espionage. Commercial, political, whatever you call. There's little difference these days. Have the British been told we caught the agent? But of course. We returned their material instantly. After taking a copy. Well, is it better than yours? It's very like mine. You mean John Wilder spied on you? But it's common knowledge that we were working on the same principle. It's only to be expected we should produce something similar uh, to look at. Never mind common knowledge, I want uncommon. Is yours better than his? Perhaps. I hear that the British government is considering giving Wilder a production grant. I would like to hear the same about the French government and myself. You might hear it sooner. You gave me direct answers concerning the merit of your aircraft. I am here at the request of the appropriate minister. I should like to know why. I am also an appropriate minister now. I have developed a military aircraft on government finance. It is therefore secret. Before revealing any such secret, I must insist that you either call in the Minister for Aviation or tell me what has caused you to intrude in the affairs of his department. Gentlemen, I am Camille Tonnelier and I am Minister for the Integration of Expenditure, a newly constituted bureau of the government of the French Republic. I identify myself because so many changes have occurred in your government lately, you might not have noticed those occurring in mine. <laughs> Permit me to congratulate each of you on having survived the election. Uh, let me introduce you to my companion. Sir Gerald Merle, MP. Sir Samuel Hesterby, MP, DFC and Bar. Mr. James Cameron Grant, MP, DFC. And Mr. Ted Solby, MP. Oh, uh, Monsieur Evray, Managing Director of the Evray Aviation Company. You have met Monsieur Debray before, Sir Gerald? No, but I have tried to. Is there anyone here I have met only Monsieur Grant before? Oh, an accomplishment, Mr. Grant. Monsieur Debray usually avoids meeting politicians, except those connected with the French Ministry of Aviation. However, his presence today endorses the sincerity of my government in the proposal I now intend to put to you. In confidence, gentlemen. I confess myself a little puzzled. <coughs> you, sir, are the minister of one government making a proposal to another government. But we are not ministers of that other government. We are backbenchers. Influential backbenchers, Sir Gerald. In matters concerning aviation. Am I to understand, then? That yes. That you are taking the extraordinary step of asking us to lobby our own government. And opposition. Well, what's extraordinary about that? Well, it is, in my experience. You must have had more. Have you never seen, Jerry, one government approach another on a ministerial and public level, only for the proposal to be ransacked by the press and pillaged by the opposition in search of grounds for domestic controversy? I imagine Monsieur Tonnelli wishes to follow the more civilized procedure, which, as far as I can remember, my memory is poor these days, is to ask us privately to consider something as a matter of national, not electoral importance, and then to urge our respective parties to do the same when the proposal is formally presented. If it ever is. Oh, Jerry, do subside. Be like Monsieur Evray. He hasn't said a word yet. Uh, how do you do, sir? Good morning, Sir Samuel. He has said nothing because he has been given no say. He is here under protest. Gentlemen, you in Britain already have two vertical takeoff fighters in production. Nevertheless, you are considering the production of another. Uh, we too have developed such an aircraft, which waits only on a financial grant from our government. Now, while NATO might buy one, it will certainly not buy more. 
in which case one of our governments is going to suffer an enormous loss of public money. Well, gentlemen, my proposal is simple. Let us agree to produce only one. I trust the better one? Naturally. But which is the better? Monsieur de Vray cannot tell us. Perhaps, Sir Gerald, you can. Our aircraft is on the secret list. Exactly, so is ours. My proposal is that neither should be. In earnest of it, I am prepared to give you full technical uh, specifications. On what conditions? On no conditions. Uh, I take it you feared I would insist on an exchange of information. I should have liked to. But there is no time for conditions, only for decisions. If NATO is presented with two aircraft to choose from, NATO will delay. If NATO delays, the Americans will have time to present their veto. It will be an old story. The later the aircraft, the more modern it will seem to be. Also, I think we all agree, we need the money more than the Americans do. But one of us would get no money. Whoever withdrew would receive from the other guarantees to abstain from competition in the matter of troop carriers. Well, if this sort of thing becomes a habit, there'll never be any need to join the common market. <laughs> Whenever I encounter a one-way street in France, Monsieur Tonnelier, I hesitate. Halfway down, I so often find myself the only driver obeying the sign. Now, if you unveil your secrets without requiring us to unveil ours, how can you expect to satisfy yourself which is the better aircraft? No, my problem is not to satisfy myself, but the British. Even so? Even so, I should expect one of three things to follow. First, having seen our performance figures, your experts might decide on our veto. In which case, it would be only politic for your government to withdraw, while the troop carrier offer still stood. And you wouldn't need to see our specifications? No. But if your experts decide on your veto, well, yes, at that point, I should need to know on what they had based their opinion. And the third possibility? Nah. I am dealing with the British, Sir Samuel. I never know what third possibilities there might be with them. And I never know whether French politicians mean what they say. Permit me to demonstrate, Monsieur de Vray. Uh, gentlemen, I have here four dossiers, one for each of you. I deliver them with reluctance. I am compelled. If you will open them, I will describe briefly what they contain. Monsieur Solvay. Monsieur Cameron Grant. Thank you. Sir Samuel. Monsieur. Sir Gerald. Uh, no, monsieur. It would put me in an impossible position, morally, as a director of one of the companies concerned. I have overridden Monsieur de Bray's objection in that, Sir Gerald. He accepts my complete trust in your discretion. Thank you. I believe you. But I will not undertake to keep confidence concerning secret information, which, because of my connection with the aircraft, however remote, I should consider it my... Um, Duty? No. Let us not employ euphemism. I should consider it my business to find out and to reveal. Monsieur le Ministre, gentlemen, I must ask you to excuse me. You were saying, Monsieur Evray. Good morning, Sir Gordon. Good morning, Laura. Yes, I saw it. And? I do sit down. And I should say it's true. Why? Well, since you wouldn't touch it otherwise. There are such writers? I think I was one. All he's saying, really, is that the Paris press is gossiping about some secret Anglo-French deal concerning Beatles. Hmm. But their papers and ours would have gone to bed at pretty well the same time. Sir Rossiter didn't read it. He was told it. By whoever told the French? I should think so. The operative word in this is secret, but obviously someone's already broken confidence. Yes? Oh, yes. Uh, ask Mr. Henderson to wait a moment, please. Mr. Wilder went to Paris on Friday. Did you know that? Mr. Wilder very seldom tells me what he's doing. Giving you rough passages, eh? He rocks me. I rock him. Good. Sir Gerald also went. Yes, Monday. He's due back this morning. Yes, I've left a message for him at the airport. But I can't trace Wilder. Is that why you've called in Henderson? 
Uh, ask Mr. Henderson to come in now, please. Oh, don't go. The sooner these aviators get used to you, the better. I've never had trouble with Henderson. No, I don't suppose you would have. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Gordon. Good morning. Miss Charles. Hello, Don. Uh, show him there. No, I've uh, seen it. Opinion? Mm, well, I've hardly had time to digest it. Uh, sit down. Oh. Well, it uh, could be very good news. Or oh, very bad. Could you extend your speculations beyond the uh, obvious? Well, I don't know that I should, Sir Gordon. I mean, Mr. Wilde is away. I'm only the sales director. Ah, yes. Uh, so many sovereigns lately? Hmm? Well, six in the last... Uh, uh, you in person? Actually, none. Oh, Hopkins does all that now, doesn't he? Yes. Answerable to me. And what do you do? Answerable to yourself? Well, Mr. Wilde has switched me to the VTOL. Uh, how do you go about selling aircraft before it's known they'll ever be produced? Well, one examines the potential market in case they are. Good answer. Even if it is your first. However, I thought you were with Scott Furlong, Mr. Henderson. Surely the VTOL was developed at Ryan Airframes under David Corbett. Why is Wilder in Paris? He isn't. No? I believe he's in Rome. What makes you believe that? Well, he telephoned me from there this morning. Ah, you're a Wilder man, aren't you? Hmm? If I asked you what was discussed, you would tell me Wilder rings every morning as a matter of routine, wouldn't you? Well, he does, Sir Gordon. Why disguise the fact he was in Paris? His secretary didn't when I phoned this morning. I merely said that he's at present in Rome. On his way to Brussels now, though. Really? His secretary didn't tell me that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Henderson. After Brussels, is he returning here? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Well, where can I contact you in Brussels? I don't, I don't know. Does it seem to you he's trying to avoid me? Does it you? There are very few Wilder men, Henderson. Did you know that? There are very few because eventually Wilder feels under some faint, small compulsion to return their loyalty. At such moments, he ceases to feel like Wilder and he gets rid of them. Being on the board of Scott Furlong never helped any of them. If this group is going to produce vetoes on government money, it won't be at Scott Furlong under Wilder if I can prevent it, and he knows that. I see no future for military aviation in this country. I want to keep Scott Furlong on civil projects. However, if the government insisted on putting up facilities for the VTOL at Ryan Airframes, I couldn't object. Have you ever thought of trying to get on the board of Ryan's? No. Should you ever, I could see that you would. And Corbett would be glad to have you, I'm sure. Yes? Gerald Merle has arrived. What was Wilder's reaction to the news this morning? Not too displeased, I imagine. Knowing that a deal of this sort might push the government into a decision earlier than I'd like. Allowing him to go straight into production at Scott Furlong months before facilities could be put up at Ryan's under Corbett. I could never be a Corbett man, Sir Gordon. Uh, yes, show Sir Geraldine, please. Uh, don't go, Henson. Stay and meet one of my men. I read it coming over on the plane. A deliberate leak. I wish I could be sure it was the French who were to blame. When you saw Tonelli, did he say anything about this deal? Any hint at all? He spoke of nothing else. It happened to be what he wanted to see me about. Yes? Yes, I don't think he'll last very long. Too young. Too conceited. Too clever by half. I mean, all this sort of thing's typical of him. Flash. <clears throat> Do you want to take notes for Wilder? Well... Frankly, I can't tell you anything that you won't read for yourself in the paper. 
I mean, I called in at the Globe on my way from the airport, and the latest reports from Paris make it plain that the French have released secret information about their veto to a party of British backbenchers. And now that's out, the French government are expected to make formal proposals at once. You were one of the party. Yes. Yeah? But as I say, I can tell you nothing that you won't find in the press for yourself. Sir Gerald, the French don't expect details of our veto in return, do they? Only if our government backs ours. But you said the French had already given us details of their veto. Oh, yes, they have. On paper. Quite a substantial dossier. One for each backbencher. When Wilder rings tomorrow, they'll tell him Corbett has the French data and his research and development team are going over it. Corbett? How did he get hold of it? He hasn't yet. But he will just as soon as you can give it to him. My dear Gordon, I can't do that. I have no dossier. But you said you had, Gerald. No. The others may have accepted. I refused, without hesitation. You refused what? Secret information concerning a competitor's product? I'm commercially connected with the bank. I mean, how on earth could I accept such information in political confidence? No, no, no. I didn't think twice about it. The next time you find yourself in this position, Gerald, have the kindness to the bank to think at least once. I'm not only a director of the bank, Gordon. Are you claiming parliamentary privilege here? Oh, I'm certainly not going to use my political position to act as a commercial spy. You're on this board because of that position. Sir Gerald, uh, who else was there? Ted Solby, Sam Hesterby, Grant. Well, I mean, I can tell you those names because they've been published in the French press. Anything you find out, Henderson, I want you to tell me. I, I won't say it before you tell Wilder, but as soon as, understand? My contract is with Mr. Wilder, Sir Gordon. Also, if I can get hold of any secret French data, it'll be only to augment secret British data. Anything I told you would be a breach of security. Then, good morning. Good morning, Sir Gerald. Laura. You won't get anywhere with Hester, May. What about the others? Do you know Solvay? Not as well as I know Grant. Normally, I would say that Grant was entirely corruptible. But in this case, no. He can't afford to be. How soon can you see him? Tonight. Well, as soon as you can. Yes, tonight. Well, I might as well be on my way. Yes, I don't see any point in your remaining. Thank you, Laura. Ring Mr. Corbett, please. Ask him if he'd be kind enough to dine with me this evening. Hmm. Hello, Gerald. Good morning, Jim. Charming office. I don't know why I expected to see posters on the walls. I know why. I advertise. Don't we all? In politics? Uh, please oh. do. Well, now. It was very good of you to see me at such short notice. I try never to keep anybody waiting. It suggests a wish to impress. Look, I don't want to hire you, but will this take long? Because if so, I'll shoot these out first. No, 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 no. I'll be brief. It's a delicate matter, and the fewer words, the better. Although we belong to the same party, Jim, I wouldn't say that we always shared the same view. I thought you enjoyed disagreeing with me. But not in public. It's bad for the party. Agreed. And in these times, what's bad for the party is bad for the country. Yes, well... Well, I'll be frank. I have no doubts of your integrity. But on this matter... Which matter? The veto? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I merely want to give you a friendly uh, tip, intimation, that I suspect you may be approached by somewhat competing interests. Now, I'm quite sure you'll deal with them as you should as a member of the House. But if there were any subsequent breach of confidence from another quarter, and if it were known that you'd received representatives of the interest to whom such information was uh, leaked, yes, divulged, well then, Jim, you might be suspected. I mean, by the press, for instance. I can assure you that any interests I receive will be in complete confidence. Ah, assuming you can identify them, assuming they come to you under their own colors. Now, Jim, two names. 
A Mr. Donald Henderson. He's nominally sales director at Scott Furlong, and that might give you the impression that he's merely connected with civil aircraft, not military. Mm, the sovereign and not the veto. Yes. Yes. And the other person is a Miss Laura Chalice. Now, you may not have seen, indeed, I believe you were in New York at the time, a small announcement. I'll get you another one cut. That looks as if it's stuck, too. Oh, why don't you get one of those that do it for you? Because they deny one the pleasure of doing it for oneself. Oh, for me? Mm-hmm. From Tonnelier. I don't know him. Yes, you do. He's a new French minister for the integration of expenditure. Why is he expending money on me? <laughs> well, he had a present for everyone yesterday. And everyone's wife. You are a widower. Well, as a Frenchman, he felt that that was no circumscription. What did he give Sir Gerald? The pip. I asked you out. I am out. Something wrong? I don't know. You're showing me you can cook. Hmm? What's on? Can't you tell from the wine? Oh. Well, that would argue your taste was as eccentric as mine. No, 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 no. I went to the bank. You asked me to dine with you the first night you were back, before you went, you know. Yes, but not to cook for me. I intended to cook for you when I saw your cooker. Is it really wood? The facade is. How's yours? I never gossip about my employer. But when they know how often you come to my flat, they'll gossip about you. How's your drink? Mm. Not quite as I make it, but I think better. I added a drop of Tonnelier's scent. Mm. I saw Wilder in Paris. He was on his way to Rome, Brussels, and other points in NATO. Uh, this was before the Tonnelier meeting. Partridges are on, by the way. And they're pretty well ready. Do you remember he went to some trouble to meet me before the election? That was to ask me to do a job of lobbying. I rather nudged him into choosing you. Oh. Well, that was unbank-like of you. The bank doesn't know. Anyway, at that time, I was the new girl. I thought in helping Wilder, I was helping it. Hmm. Well, you know better now, don't you? I don't know about better. More. I did that lobby. I didn't realize. I thought he couldn't have asked you to, after all. I did it in my own way. You do all things thus. In what way do you propose to enjoy my cooking? Your way. Oh, by the way, has anyone at the bank noticed that my firm is handling the Scott Furlong advertising account for Wilder? Is that the price of the lobby? Has anyone? Nothing's been said to me. Mm. It's for six months. Makes me feel rather cordial to Wilder. So, I met him in Paris. Before the Tonnelier meeting? Mm. Yes, he didn't know it was on. Did you? Before it happened? Well, I'd seen the others on the plane. They were all in aviation. It wasn't too hard to guess what might be up. So, as a person on the brink of obtaining information of value to Wilder, you thought you'd see what he'd pay for it if you did? Like Sir Gerald, I had to go into the conference knowing what line I should take on personal as well as public grounds. What did Wilder pay? It never got to that stage. He's taken a personal dislike to me. Before I could say anything, he told me he appreciated the results I got for him last time, but not the way I got them. It doesn't sound like him. It sounds like Merle. Well, no, his objection isn't moral. It's simply he can't tolerate anyone working the way he does. I think he's beginning to have that difficulty about Corbett, too. 
Yes, well, at the moment, I'm easier for him to handle than Corbett. Corbett has a managing director's chair at Ryan's, but I'm only on temporary hire. What about your agreement? Well, as I say, it's just for six months. I've never yet lost an account I wish to hold. Are you losing this one? I doubt it. I shouldn't have thought you'd put yourself out too much, even for Wilder. Continue to think so. That leak about the VTOL deal, that didn't come from your tap, did it? So he'd know what he might be missing. No, no, that'll have come from Evray. If he can get the press on both sides beating their national drums, then the politicians might decide they'd better dance to the national tune. That would be the end of Anglo-French cooperation. And Evray could produce his VTOL and so could Wilder, even if NATO wanted only one of them. That's business. So the leak helps Wilder? Mm, well, not necessarily, you see. He's got to get hold of a government contract while he's got production facilities and Corbett hasn't, so Wilder will hope the government will say no to the French plane and rush into a contract with him before too much controversy can arise. And he certainly doesn't mean to be around to add to any. Why should he expect the government to say no to the French Beatles? Because unlike Evray, he has a megalomaniac's faith in whatever it is he wants to produce. Um, the bank, I gather, is on Corbett's side. I didn't see you gathering. Not from me. Now, careful. You're here to gather, too, if you can. What use would your dossier be to the <coughs> bank? If the decision's going to be political, it's too late now to improve our veto. Not too late to decide what the political decision is likely to be, though, is it? No. No. For example, if the bank did get hold of my dossier and decided that the French veto was better than ours, it could let Wilder think it was on his side, could it not? Yes. Until Wilder, backpedalling on the sovereign to make room for the veto, suddenly found himself without any aircraft to produce at all, at which point he could be bounced on a vote of no confidence. You make it sound as though Sir Gordon were more interested in getting rid of Wilder than in getting the veto. Isn't he? I think he's fighting Wilder to stay top dog. He finds Wilder uncontrollable, so Wilder must go. That's the nub of it. And Wilder, you're not suggesting he wants to become a banker? Oh, Wilder wants to be Wilder, independent of any bank. That would only be exchanging one master for another. Either he has to have the bank's money or the government. You wouldn't mind that. Particularly if he could get himself in the government one day. And you'd help him to do that? Perhaps, one day. It would depend what happened these days. So, in that event, you wouldn't like him to think you'd ever oblige Sir Gordon? Oh, no. Not in that event. Then it's not much use my asking you to give me your dossier, is it? <laughs> so let's see. I didn't for a moment think you would ask. Or that Gordon would expect you to. No? Nothing so indelicate. However, as I have seen the dossier, a word of reassurance or alarm for me would have told the bank what to expect from the government. I'm surprised Merle didn't realize that was all Sir Gordon expected of him. However, I take it you're not uttering that word. Oh, I don't know. Depends on the inducement. Well, forgive the sentimentality, but I didn't expect you to say that. I should always welcome any sentimentality from you, Laura. Are you changing the subject? Mm. I'm inviting you to cook with me. I think it's time the bank knew about the advertising account. I think you have a duty to tell Sir Gordon. And Merle? Why, well, I don't see you any duty to tell one of the directors having told the chairman. Our relationship grows less and less personal, doesn't it? I thought more and more. I work for Sir Gordon, you know. Well, then warn him I work for Wilder and shall require his personal attention, not yours, if I am to be subverted. What day are you free? Whenever he is. I have a mounting impression that you're using me, James. I should always be delighted for you to use me, Laura. I think my partridges are burning. Good. Oh, incidentally, if Sir Gordon does want to see me, you might suggest to him that Merle can best arrange it.
Isn't that Henderson of Scott Furlong going to Grant's table? Oh, well, where you were just looking. Tea? Oh, thank you. Tea. <coughs> well, how's John? Hmm? Wilder? Oh, fine. Mm -hmm. Does he phone you every morning or did he leave an itinerary where you can phone him? Uh, he phones. Ah. Yes. Then you can't tell me where he might be next? No. No. Do you see the paper this morning? The French have made a formal proposal. Yes, yes, it's uh, all over the front pages. So here you are, Mr. Henderson, at the gallop. Actually, I'm surprised you agreed to meet me at all. Uh, here, I mean, I had somewhere uh, less public in mind. Oh, why? Can't say. I... I'm not used to this. Oh. Then John doesn't expect you to buy a dossier from me, or he'd have sent someone more familiar with the form. He wants me to tell you that he's reconsidering your account, a possible extension of six months. If I what? Well, uh, is it true of what's in the globe? Well, Sir Gerald Merle was the mysterious backbencher who walked out of the Tonnelier meeting in Paris. Yes. He looks after his own publicity, you know. He's on the board of the globe. Yes, well, John isn't clear whether he saw a dossier even though he refused to take one. You can tell John there's no prospect at all of Sir Gerald giving the bank information. Well, that's what you want to know, isn't it? Yes. Or is it whether I would give the bank information? Thank you. Advise him to reconsider the account rapidly, Mr. Henderson. Milk? Oh, thank you. You could have challenged Sir Gerald yourself, you know. Didn't you see him as you came in? No. Now, where is he? Oh, gone now. At a dawdle, stopping at this table and that, which means he's in a hurry to get somewhere. Help yourself to sugar. Yes, the Globe has an afternoon sister, you know, so we'll probably read in a later edition that rumours are sweeping Westminster that a prominent backbencher has divulged confidential information to a certain commercial quarter and that his party are very embarrassed about it. Oh, do you play golf? Will mm. you go to my club? You could phone John from there. Oh, uh, all right. Mm. Mm. Oh, I forgot you can't. You don't know where to reach him. Or did you forget? Afternoon, Gerald. There's a rumor in this afternoon's yes, paper. Yes, it's graceful. Were you able to trace the source? Hardly needs tracing. The whole house saw Grant receive Henderson on the terrace. Did the whole house hear what they said to one another? Hmm? Are you seriously saying that's all it sprang from? I can think of nothing else. Well, you feel Grant habitually accepts bribes in public? Frankly, I never know what to think concerning Grant. <clears throat> that had occurred to me. Do you feel sometimes your connection with this bank puts your own political reputation in doubt? No, I do not. I mean, the answer to gossip is, is personal integrity. General, before the election, you expected win or lose, your party would promote you to its front bench. It hasn't. Do you think it ever will? Uh, Miss Chalice, I don't wonder if you would... Don't you would... think you'd be better off as managing director of Scott Furlong? Uh, in time? Well... <laughs> Is I doubt if John Wilder would ever give up that chair. I hope you don't doubt I might simply take it from him. However, in recommending you to Scott Furlong, I would have to do so on your political qualifications. And it disturbs me. They haven't been of much use to this bank lately. I recommend you use them a great deal more energetically. You can begin by arranging for Grant to see me. I can tell you, Gordon, with complete conviction, two things. No matter what the inducement, I would never be party to a breach of confidence. Second? Uh, Laura, perhaps you had better leave. Sir Gerald might then speak more frankly. After all, you were a journalist once, may become one again. Second, Gerald? Grant can tell you nothing without ruining himself politically. Anyhow, you may remember, before the election, he spoke against the whole concept of VTOL aircraft on television. Yes, I remember the occasion, Gerald. Wilder wanted you to lobby for the VTOL and you'd refused. But Grant attacked not only the VTOL, he attacked your integrity. 
and that forced you to defend both. He's a wilder man with things the wilder way, upside down from behind without anyone noticing, particularly you. Yes. There it is. An advertising account agreed three days before the famous interview from Wilder to Grant with strings. Get that young man for me, Gerald. Here. He has to be stopped. Where? At his offices. Today, if it would be convenient. The place would be, but not the time. Monday morning, 10 o'clock. I think he'd prefer before the weekend. Well, I'm sure he would. A few days ago, you told me you never kept people waiting in case they might think you were trying to impose on them. I recommend the same course of action to yourself. Then I shall take it immediately. I'll see him over there. Thank you for your recommendations. Good morning, Sir Gerald. Good morning. Tea. Oh, thank you. Uh, no sugar. <laughs> well, now, let's see. Uh, John wishes me to know that the advertising account will be extended, right? I don't know why I bother to come. Oh, well, I shan't send you away empty-handed. I'm not sure my firm can handle an extension. Throw that at him, and then throw this. The first years of a new parliament aren't very exciting for us backbenchers. I'm looking for something to occupy my mind until the knives come out again. Something in aviation. A director's chair. What is it like on the board at Scott Furlong? Well, he wouldn't. I mean, why should he? It's not as if he wants anything from you. It's simply that he doesn't want you to give anything to other people. I was going to ask you to play golf again next Monday morning, but now I can't because I have to meet Sir Gordon Revage at the Elbertson Merchant Bank at 10 o'clock. Oh. Well, uh... Where can I reach you over the weekend um, after I've thrown that at him? Well, I'll be out of town. Try my flat nine in the morning, Monday. There's no chance of your seeing Sir Gordon before then, is there? Absolutely none at all. I shall see him on Monday, punctually at ten. Sir Gerald, no. Very well. Show him in. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Sir Gordon. When Grant comes, take no notes, but make a draft of the conversation as it's finished. Apply your journalist's memory. Oh, am I? Um... Oh, yes, you are. I'm expecting Grant. I know. That's why I'm here. I don't require you to be, and your presence might embarrass him. Well, he wouldn't be here but for me, and my presence was the condition for my arranging his. I don't recall <coughs> our making a condition. I made it with myself, Gordon. I warned you that I wouldn't be privy to a breach of confidence that might do harm to my party. And I trust that uh, the same integrity might be imposed upon Grant, perhaps even upon you. Yes? Oh, yes, send Mr. Henderson in. Henderson? Why not? If I make a deal with Grant, and Wilder knows Henderson's is here when I do it, how much trust do you think he'll place in Henderson in the future? Good morning, Scott. Good morning. Wilder make his usual morning call? Uh, yes, from Paris. Uh, uh, on route to, uh, to contact Mr. Grant with his answer. I don't know exactly what bargain was suggested, but from the way you came in, Wilder said yes. Uh, sit down. Do you have a pleasant weekend, Laura? Yes. Have you anything to tell me about it? No, Sir Gordon, I certainly have not. I should like you to mix more business with less pleasure in future, Miss Chellis. <coughs> yes? Grant is here. Yes? Now. Good morning, Mr. Grant. I think you know everybody here. Yes. Good morning. Uh, you are Sir Gordon, I take it? What else would you like to take? 
It seems to be my morning for collecting. I've just spoken to a subsidiary of yours, John Wilder. You mean you sold the dossier to him? Oh, don't be too pleased about it, Gerald. He wasn't in the market for it, so you can't gossip me down in the house there. Hello, Laura. I told you not to sit in the sun. You're peeling. Then what have you sold him? Silence. Silence on the dossier's technical contents where you are concerned in return for his support. Might I know in what connection? Hmm, a seat on the board of Scott Furlong. Oh, not much, is it? Ryan Airframes is the place these days. That's the firm with the potential in this combine, not Scott Furlong. Indeed, I predict so placid a time with Scott Furlong in future that Wilder will be glad to get out and hand over to someone less energetic. Some seat warmer. Yes, I considered that possibility before I accepted. And why did you accept? Before hearing what I wanted and what I would offer for it. Well, I know what you want. Not the dossier, but the government's likely course of action, which you feel I can predict, having seen the dossier. Do you know what I'd offer? Mm, my impression was a seat on the board of Ryan Airframes. Then why did you close with Wilder? Because <laughs> I saw no reason to turn down one seat when I could have both. And you can stand there quite cynically, quite openly. I am merely telling Sir Gordon that despite your inhibiting presence, I am in a position to tell him what he wishes to know. I can also tell you that your offer is acceptable. Look, Jim, if you sell John out, he'll... I'm not selling anybody out. I'm simply giving everybody what they want, that's You're all. You're telling me to break you politically, and I shall. I shouldn't have thought you'd ever wait for me to compel you to do that. Well? I'm content. Hmm. Well, what's my guarantee? I am prepared to circulate an advice to the boards concerned that to be elected not only to Ryan Airframes, but to Scott Furlong. I'm also prepared to issue a press statement as soon as I have their answers, which, with one exception, I can safely predict. Now, that will take all day. Can you come back this evening? No. What more do you want? Oh, not more or less. Just your word. Well, with this chalice present, able one day to publish the story of all our lives, is that why you joined the bank, I wonder? Look, Grant, I'm warning you for the last time. The government's position is this. It won't be able to consider the French proposal until it's first decided whether it wants another VTOL produced at all. Which means, as the French are not now prepared to wait for an answer, that the whole transaction will have to be abandoned. Good. If you can satisfy me as to your sources... Well, I'm one. All members who attended and stayed at the Tornelier meeting were consulted by their parties as soon as the French acted formally. No party conflict arose, so there was a sensible amount of inter-party consultation. Oh, Sir Gerald wasn't consulted because he had no dossier. So from the nature of the consultation, you inferred the government's position. Is that satisfactory? No, 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 no there's more. After Sir Gerald left, Tonellier told us that if the British press speculated, he would have to advise his government to move instantly. Well, I think Sir Gerald will agree that the British press did speculate. I won't ask him to agree that he helped it to. So, the French did move, and as Tonnelier had warned us, they expected an answer within five days. And today's the day. Yes. Now, the evening papers in London come out at ten in the morning. Would you like to see a copy? Are you saying, young man, you've sold me information that was already public knowledge, which I could have bought for fourpence? Well, what else could I have sold? You'd surely never expect me to break confidence. I don't know, Grant. I very seriously don't know. Not to be thought of, is it, Gerald? <laughs>